Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bethany Lutheran Church. It is a joy to be together for worship this morning. Whether you're joining us here on campus in our sanctuary or together with us on the live stream, know that you are welcome here at Bethany and that we are excited to experience the joy of Easter for a third week in a row uh, as we celebrate Easter, the third Sunday of Easter, together this morning. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Nate Preisinger. I serve here as one of the pastors. I serve alongside Pastor Gary Sandberg, as well as our Director of Pastoral Care, Janet Mortensen, and our pastoral intern, Rita Argus. Intern Rita this morning is not with us. She won't be guiding us through worship this morning. She is helping out at a local congregation that does not have a pastor currently. So we uh, loaned her out, shall we say, to give her some more experience and giving them the chance to experience Rita's excellent leadership and preaching abilities. So uh, we wish her well, and you will see Intern Rita again real soon, I promise. Uh, But please know, if it is your first time here at Bethany or your first time at Bethany in a long time, please do take a moment this morning to introduce yourself to myself or Pastor Gary or other members of the staff. We are so excited to see new faces or faces coming back into the sanctuary and would love to have a moment to talk with you after worship if you're able. One brief note before we begin worship this morning, there is a rose on our altar and that always means that there's a birth within the congregation that we are excited to celebrate. This one is extra special. Sarah Huslander, who works in our office during the week, she um, has a new great grand niece. And so we put a rose on the altar in honor of Adeline Jean and we remember her in our prayers this morning as well. Well, friends, we are in the season of Easter. This is a season of resurrection and joy and a reminder of the ways that God brings new life out of the old. We'll talk about that a little bit more in our sermon this morning, but we begin our worship with a time of thanksgiving for baptism as another way of remembering the ways that God breaks in and brings new life to each and every one of us. I invite you to stand at this moment and face the font as we take part in a time of thanksgiving for baptism. We are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the first Easter morning, the female disciples discovered an empty tomb. This morning, we gather at our empty tomb. The baptismal font is the place where we died with Christ and rose to a new way of life. We thank God this day for the gift of baptism and the promises of resurrection for all the ways that God has delivered God's people. We give you thanks, O God, for all the ways that you have used water to save your people. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word, you created the world, calling forth a life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as your children, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. We praise you, mighty God, for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives so that we might reflect your grace and love in all we do. Amen. We join in singing our gathering hymn.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen, amen. Let us pray. Eternal and all-merciful God, with all the angels and all the saints, we laud your majesty and might. By the resurrection of your Son, show yourself to us and inspire us to follow Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the word. Our lesson today is from Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 1. Saul, later called Paul, was an ardent persecutor of all who followed the way of Christ. This reading recounts the story of his transformation, beginning with an encounter with Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus. The reading. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, 
Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to John. After Jesus appeared to his followers in Jerusalem, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, ha you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from land, only about a hundred yards away. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter replied to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your arms, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, I want to congratulate all of you for remaining standing through that entire gospel reading. It was a long one, um, and that there are a lot of incredible details for us to dig into with that story here this morning. But I want to start with a few confessions of my own. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can get so frustrated with a task or a situation that I'll just throw up my hands and, and give up. For example, 
There have been many times lately where I have been so frustrated as I dig through the Tupperware drawer at my house, looking for a lid that will fit the Tupperware containing I'm trying to use. And I'll finally just say, you know what? I give up, and instead I'll wrap my children's lunches in aluminum foil. There are many, many other stories that I could share about times when I experienced something stressful or difficult, and rather than address it head on, I just took the easy way out. Oftentimes, I don't even realize that I'm doing this, but I'll just go back to whatever is comfortable or familiar because I can't take the stress of it all. I'm guessing you might do things like this too. Perhaps when things are stressful, or overwhelming or painful, perhaps you find yourself retreating back to something more comfortable or familiar. I wonder if that's what's happening with Peter in our gospel passage this morning. This entire gospel passage is, is fascinating and long, as we've discussed, and carries some strange details about Peter's behavior in the days after Jesus' resurrection. And now remember, that Peter himself has been through a lot leading up to this moment. He denied Jesus three times when Jesus was on trial. He saw or at least heard about Jesus' brutal crucifixion by the Roman authorities. And then Peter saw and experienced Jesus raised from the dead. And this must have been an awful lot for a guy like Peter to wrap his mind around. Those are stressful, amazing, fascinating situations that don't easily compute with the human brain. And so I wonder if that's why Peter goes back to doing what was easy for him. He goes back to what he knows. He goes fishing. Peter was a fisherman in the three years before Jesus called him. And so this is where he returns to at this moment of inner turmoil. And I wonder, with all that Peter was dealing with, if he wasn't able to fish as well as he used to. Have you ever had that happen to you? Where you're so stressed or overwhelmed that really simple tasks suddenly become very, very difficult? Have you ever been so scattered or overworked that you completely forget your password to the, your computer that you use every day? Or, or maybe you're running around the house because you're late for a meeting and you're saying, where are my keys? Where are my keys? Until a loving family member says, they're in your hand. <laughs> Scientists will tell us that intense stress can negatively affect our executive function. This is why situations like this happen to all of us. And I wonder if that's what's going on with Peter here. Is that why he can't catch any fish? This was his livelihood for years before he started following Jesus, and now suddenly he's completely unable to catch a single fish in an entire evening of fishing. But then again, as we often know, sometimes people go fishing and the fishing isn't really the point. Maybe Peter wasn't fishing at all that night. Maybe he was just so distraught and confused about all that he had just lived through just needed to get out on the water to clear his head. And I really wonder just about all of what's going through Peter's head because of what he does next. Because the next morning, Jesus appears on the floor and he guides the disciples to catch dozens of fish. And not only is that strange that Peter was never able to catch any of these fish at all, even though there were seemingly many right there for the taking. It's also strange because Peter doesn't recognize Jesus in that moment. And then, to top it all off, look at what Peter does next. Once he finally understands that it's Jesus on the shore, the text tells us that Peter puts on clothes. Because apparently that's another thing that he forgot to do that day. He spent the whole night fishing naked, not catching anything, and then he realizes that it's Jesus on the shore. And so Peter puts on his clothes and jumps into the water to swim to shore. And apparently, the boat wasn't even that far off to begin with. It arrives almost immediately after Peter, so he could have saved himself from all the messiness of wet clothes after the fact. What a strange set of details the gospel writer John gives us. But as I've been saying all along, 
I think what John's trying to show us by depicting Peter in this way is that Peter is struggling with a lot. There's a lot going on in his head. There's a lot that he's still processing. And sometimes we, too, find ourselves in deeply emotionally distraught circumstances like these when we don't make the decisions either. I'm taking so much time to point all this out to you because I want you to know that you're not alone. I feel like a lot of times in our life we are afraid to admit that we make mistakes or that we're having trouble dealing with the stress of everything going on in our life or that we're carrying emotional pain that's so overwhelming sometimes we can barely function. I want you to know that if you've ever been in a situation like this, you're not alone. In fact, the disciple Peter was once in a place just like that too. And I want you to know that Jesus doesn't want you to give up when you're in moments like that. When you think about it, it kind of looked like Peter was giving up that day at the beginning of our story. He had left everything and followed around Jesus for three years, but now as he dealt with his own guilt and his own shame and sorrow and confusion, as he dealt with all of this, he just goes back to fishing. Go back to being a fisherman and to just forget about all this Jesus stuff. But even if Peter might have wanted to give up, Jesus doesn't give up on Peter. Jesus came back for him. And Jesus gave Peter a new way forward. It seems strange because Jesus asks Peter almost the same question three times in a row. At first he says, do you love me? Well, then feed my lambs. And then the second time it's tend my sheep. And then the final time it's feed my sheep. The importance, though, isn't in these subtle shifts of what Jesus says. The importance is that Jesus asks Peter three times. You see, Jesus was giving Peter three distinct chances to affirm his commitment to Jesus. Because remember, not long ago, Peter had denied knowing Jesus three times. You see, this conversation between Peter and Jesus on the beach that day, it's actually a healing miracle. Jesus is healing the emotional pain that Peter was still holding on to. This strange conversation of the, on the beach was Jesus providing Peter with a second chance, an opportunity to put the past behind him and step forward into the future with renewed purpose. Sometimes in life, you are going to face incredibly painful and difficult moments. Just like Peter, we're all going to do things that we regret. We're going to lose friends, and witness atrocities, and be overcome with grief, and you very well might feel like you don't know how to move past all of it. But I promise you that if you keep your eyes and ears open, you will see the ways that Jesus is coming back for you to lead you onto a new path, just like he did for Peter. And I'm not just talking about Jesus forgiving you for all your wrongs here. Jesus didn't just say to Peter, hey, we're good now. Because Jesus is even better than that. He gave Peter the chance to redeem his past mistakes. To take what was broken and make it new. And it goes further than that because these affirmations that Peter gave to Jesus that day, this would be the beginning of a new life for Peter. One filled with affirmations of Jesus. Because as we know, Peter went on to proclaim in the cities and to argue with the high priests and to tell anyone who would listen that he was a follower of Jesus Christ and that Jesus is Lord. Friends, this is how God works. God doesn't just forgive. God redeems. All of humanity, all of this broken, messed up world that we live in will ultimately be redeemed by the power of God in Christ Jesus. That's the gospel promise. That's what the Bible is all about. Redemption is not just Peter's story. It's Rahab's story, and it's David's story, and it's Naomi's story, and it's Jacob's story, and it's Abraham's story, and it's Saul's story, and it's your story too. Your sin 
your mistakes, your failures, are not going to be brushed aside and ignored. No, because God's even better than that. God's going to redeem those failures. God's going to take those mistakes and burdens that you carry and turn them into something life-giving and beautiful. We don't have to go back to our old ways. We don't have to give up and hide. We don't have to carry around our guilt with us forever because God has shown us and promised us that whatever your past may contain, God will find a way to redeem that and to mold it into a new and hopeful future. Amen. You'll find it on page 9 in your worship bulletin, Now the Green Blade Rises. I invite you to rise as we sing. We join together using the words that unite us in our faith, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you into a spirit of prayer. Holy One of new beginnings, fill us with new life. Send us into the world as you will send your servant Paul to invite people to come and see your wondrous acts. 
Oh God, revive ecosystems along coastlands that have been devastated by natural forces or human negligence. Reestablish plant and animal life that purifies air and water and that feeds humans and other living creatures. Restore all your people, O God, who cry to you for help. Today we name before you Don, Cooper, Lenora, Lee, Ian, John, Mark, Dan, Buzz, Kathy, Zachary. We also ask that you would bring comfort to the families of Meredith and Mary. Let them feel your presence. O oh God, bring peace to troubled lives, communities, and nations. Bless the efforts of all who offer aid to those who are displaced by war. In your mercy, O oh God, we ask that you would respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of God's peace with those who are around you. We move into the time that we call Abundantly Bethany as we share the ministries that happen here and the ministries that connect us around the world. And as a part of that, we have a special guest. One of our global mission partners has our, our, the principal leader of that ministry uh, with us this morning. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself and bring a greeting to the congregation. Thank you. Uh, we are coming from Estonia. And that's one of the Baltic states in Eastern Europe. And we're happy to be here. We are representing here with my nephew, four generations of Estonian family there serving and sharing the word of God for Estonian people. Because my grandfather was a Lutheran pastor, my father is, my two other brothers, myself, and now fourth generation is there as well. So we were occupied by Russia for 50 years after World War II. And that made a great cut in our history that we lost our connection to our Christian identity. Now our job is to build up this connection again. So we will be sharing about that after second service in the chapel. So we are welcome to join and hear our story, how we are working for generations to come there in Estonia. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Now, Simon and Matt will also be available in the fellowship hall in between services, but to really get an idea of the full scope of that ministry and why it's such an important part of the way we support ministries around the world. Again, at 11.15, um, you can have a chance to finish your coffee and a quick donut and uh, join us in there if you can be here after that second worship service of the day. On page 15 in your worship bulletin are other ways that we are in ministry together. Today, also in the fellowship hall, the bake sale from one of our confirmation students as her confirmation product, Addie Maturo, will be there. We invite you to join in and uh, clean off those tables as all of those proceeds will go to domestic violence. The fair trade's in there as well. Next Sunday, a diaper drive. You can bring, uh, if you want, packages of diapers and just put them all up here at the altar area before church, or we'll invite you sometime during or you can just drop them off in the south entrance if that is more convenient for you next week. Note our Wednesday nights are coming. And then uh, do check the email blast. It has all kinds of ways we continue in ministry together, including the way we support Habitat for Humanity and their kind of fun walk that's coming up as a part of that. All that information is on the 
uh, is on the email blast that come to you every Thursday. And the note on the back page, you may have seen a few staff members wearing really cool permanent name tags that you don't have to fill out the little sticky ones every Sunday, and you can order one of those if you would like. All the information is included on the back page of your worship bulletin. You can even uh, tear that off and take it home with you. Note that a lot of that can simply happen online. You can go online and take care of ordering one of those. But if you have any questions on that, just see Colleen or Sarah at the Mission Center uh, and they'll guide you through whatever you need to know. We'd love to have people have the opportunity to have those so we can get to know each other even better in the midst of our congregational life. All of the ways that we support the ministries within our community and around the world come because we are people of a generous God, and when we respond in generosity, all those ministries come to life. As we move into this time of offering in your worship bulletin, our ways that you can make a digital gift, of course, are always baskets. If you brought a paper offering, you can leave that as you exit the sanctuary this morning. As we move into this time of offering, our chancel choir brings us an offertory anthem. Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. We gather now as witnesses of the resurrection at Christ's table. Please note that everyone is invited to participate in Holy Communion here this morning. This is not an invitation from me or from Bethany Lutheran Church. We believe that this is an invitation from Jesus Christ himself. If you will be spiritually nourished by this meal, please come and be fed at Christ's table. Our entire communion liturgy is printed in your bulletin. It begins at the bottom of page 10. I invite you to stand. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let 
let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, it is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Christ took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you, it is shed for all people, for the forgiveness of your sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering then Christ's death and resurrection, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. The instructions for communion distribution this morning are printed in your bulletin at the bottom of page 11, but things are a little different than what you might be used to in recent weeks. Um, this week, we will have the intinction stations available. You'll be invited to come forward at the direction of an usher, and you can receive a wafer and then dip it in the cup that's also there, thereby receiving the body and blood of Christ. However, please note that if you are, um, would require a gluten-free option or an alcohol-free option, or if you're just more comfortable with the pre-packaged communion kits, we will also have those available. Just make your way to a station with someone holding one of these silver trays. That's where you can receive the pre-packaged communion kits. And we invite you to receive that pre-packaged kit and then return to your pew and open up the pre-packaged kit there. Both ways are still communion, both ways are still very good, just trying to accommodate the different comfort levels of our entire community today. You'll be directed forward at the direction of an usher, just make your way to one of the stations that fits your needs this morning that is in the area in front of your seating section. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready.
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. like me, and you say, I'd love to go to a bake sale, but who carries cash anymore? Uh, you can make the donation through Bethany's online donation system if you purchase something there, and because Addie is a millennial, you can do it by Venmo or Zelle as well, and she'll make sure all of that gets, she might even be before a millennial, actually, so she's, she's, uh, she's well equipped, so just know, don't let cash stop you from being a part of the wonderful bake sale this morning. Well, may the love of God fill up your hearts. May the joy of Christ fill up your souls, and may the Spirit of God send you forth in blessing, but not for you alone, but that you might also be a blessing to others, because you are blessed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We join in singing our sending hymn. You'll find that on page 14 in your bulletin. I know that my Redeemer lives. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.